Uh, this panel is called Changing the Fashion World. And our guests are Muchaneta Capfunde. Uh, I hope to pronounce it well, then if, you, if not, please correct me without any problem. Founder and editor-in-chief of uh, FashionNerd.com. Muchaneta has worked um, in the fashion industry for over 14 years. She's currently one of the leading influencers writing about the merger of fashion with technology and wearable tech. Besides working as a fashion consultant of, for various fashion brands, Muchaneta, a former contributor of wearable.com, is now a contributor to Vogue Business. Uh, Marta Weidel. Okay, if, if you don't say anything, uh, I can believe that I, I, I do the correct. <laughs> well, I'm okay. quite used I, I was I was I was waiting for the correction. <laughs> anyway, he's a founder of. I'm used to why those. <laughs> I played and uh, a fashion researcher speci speciali specializing in technology, sustainability, and consumer behavior and digital marketing. Having started off in a computer science, Marta has combined her interests uh, to explore the boundaries uh, of how technology can motivate and drive change to a more sustainable fashion future. Marta is also an active public speaker on her research and on how gaming uh, can influence the future of fashion and consumer behaviors. So, the title is Changing the Fashion World. Since the world is changing now, has changed the last year with COVID, as we all know. My first question, my first, yeah, my first question is how COVID, how this year has changed the fashion world and now the fashion world is changing now. Maybe we can start with Muchaneta and then just start a discussion. We can't hear you. Yeah. I can't hear you at least. <laughs> no, no, me neither. Maybe your mic is off. Yeah, maybe if you, okay, if you, if you try to put your, your, yeah. No, there's no, something, there's, yeah, there's some, not even there's something. <laughs> not even a sound. <laughs> if you, I had my, I had my mic off before, so maybe you, you have to uh, touch the screen and then on screen you will have the different option. It will show up. Slightly different than Zoom. It should be. It, it's, it, it shows that it, I it's can not. Send you, okay. Maybe, maybe if you can unplug your uh, earphones, maybe we can try without them. If you can hear me, Muchaneta. Maybe, yeah, maybe try to unplug your uh, earphones. Uh, Muchaneta, your mic is off, so that's for sure. So you need to. Th thank you, Marta, for was... helping. I will email. I will email the, <laughs> the picture. Now, okay. Now it's freezed. Also, so it's complete. Can okay. you hear me now? Now, yes, yes, Yay. yes. Hey. Welcome back. Yes. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. I switched it off and switched it back on. Oh, uh, perfect. Oh, perfect. Technology. <laughs> okay. So, so you're asking about COVID, yes? Yeah, I was asking about this last year that changed mm. everything and what the the change. Uh, I mean, in the fashion. Uh, in fashion in the fashion world uh -huh. well we all know fashion industry is was very i won't say is anymore was quite reluctant to change um they were happy doing business the way they've always done it because for them it worked the majority of brands it worked um and what COVID did is that it accelerated um the kind of like the need for technology the adoption for technology which for me was was the best thing to come out of this pandemic was the fact that the fashion industry realized that how important it is to adopt various types of technology um, and being open to being educated about it. Because I felt like a lot of the brands that I used to consult, for, consult with and work with, it was an option. The idea of embracing innovation was an option. It was like, okay, we can do it or we cannot do it. But I feel like they have learned now, um, especially from the brands that haven't made it due to COVID or that were pushed over the edge due to COVID, um, that the way forward is to look at innovation and to look at how they can adopt it so it helps their business take that step forward. Um, and also just collaborations and education and sharing of ideas and knowledge. So I think it's great, um, but I do see around the corner some fashion businesses going back to the old good old ways. 
um, as soon as COVID and the pandemic is, is much more in control because I feel like they're just counting the days and the time until they can say, okay, everything's clear. Okay, let's go back to the way we used to do it. Um, so while they're unable to do so, this is the opportunity for startups, um, for kind of for tech people who kind of want to push forward the industry to really make their stamp, to really showcase what they can bring to the table. Because right now the industry is listening when before it was super hard to bring them to the table. Okay, M Marta, if you want to add something to this. Yes, yeah, so, well, first of all, as you said, uh, the COVID um, just uh, turned upside down the, the whole industry, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. Uh, we are stuck at home. Uh, we had little desire to to wear some. Uh, maybe we had the desire, but not much um, uh, opportunities to dress up. And you know, we just start dressing casual clothes and working from home. Uh, so nobody really uh, needed to to get more clothes um, for sale. So the, the there was a huge decline uh, in revenues for many fashion businesses. Many had to close down. Uh, the other, even if the, there was not on their agenda, they have to look at innovative business models. And COVID was actually like eye opener for many because uh, you know it's a it's a also a huge chance. There's a mismatch of Mishu pre pre existed uh, of the pandemic, and um, I think that it will help in general the fashion ecosystem to evolve to be more nimbler. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as we got used to and to, to shop online now, uh, for, for many that was a new one, a new, new method of buying, I think some of those behavior will stay with that. So uh, even if we are missing the physical spaces and, and many retailers are looking into investing and reshaping the, the shops, then, uh, then it still have to be uh, working very well to to gather all the experience uh, what we are getting online and in store that's really important and the huge problem was of of course the the over consumption but also over production of clothes so 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 many brands stacked with uh, unsold uh, collections that they need to rethink now because they don't want to repeat this so you can see the supply chains are becoming smaller the the factories that are trying to be closer and to have warehouses much smaller as well, because that's a huge cost. What they're gonna do with this unsold collection if it's not gonna go straight to the landfills? So there are some pluses of this terrible situation as well. But but there, there was a problem with fashion uh, before, so actually it was a huge wake up call. Yeah, I mean I agree with you completely, Marta. But I also feel like COVID did not cause a problem in the fashion industry. It just pushed hmm. a few businesses over the edge. The problems, like exactly. Marta said, were always there. COVID just yeah. basically shone a light on the problems and said, hey guys, look, this is what's wrong with this industry. And the ones that don't adopt, I'm not going to make it. And I also feel like it also helped businesses learn that brick and mortar is, is not the only store you have. You also have an online store. So a lot of companies that had brick and mortar stores had amazing store space. It looked great. It was a lovely experience walking into the store, but their online store was horrid. It looked like, it, some of them looked like basically Amazon online. It, it wasn't a great experience. It was an in and out type of experience. You go in, you get what you need, you get out. Um, so a lot of um, brick and mortar stores have realized that they have to really kind of adapt digitally. They need to come up with ways of making their online store reflect their brick and mortar. So what you get when you walk into this amazing store space, you get the same online as well. So I feel like a lot of fashion brands are looking to invest in that online experience and making their stores more than just, a, you know, another Amazon, I guess, where you can just go and get a product and get out. Uh, because a lot of consumers, as we all know, are looking for more than product these days. They are looking for that experience. So it's pushed forward this need to renovate their online space, which is, a, for me, I think it's a, it's a great thing. You, 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 so I read yesterday that uh, by 2026 in the US alone, uh, as online shopping grows, that it's predicted that 80,000 stores will be closed because the digital shopping habits are staying with us. But also, you know, as I mentioned, you know, many brands are looking at creating new stores to engage with consumers because we really want to go touch products as well for many that's 
still something very important even to smell to touch you know how it feels you can't really uh, still translate it to online but we might just go to to see the product and still buy it online right and we're expecting similar experience mm -hmm. online but i think this is true of luxury brands the reason why you buy into luxury brands because you want to go into like a gucci store and have that whole experience of being in a gucci store um so i don't think it retail itself um will stop but I do think that the kind of business model that the retailers use today does need to be modernized, does need to keep up with what's going on in terms of innovation. And I think once they kind of do that revamp of the online store and the experience, such as, for example, adding something as simple as, uh, simple as RFID codes and things like that, which is very, very simple tech. It's nothing spectacular, but it kind of enhances the customer's experience. So I think like what you said, uh, Marta, you might go and look at it in store, but then imagine ordering it in the store and then having it delivered to your house the next day. So you physically don't have to walk around with your carrier bags. You know, these are very small changes using technology that's been around for a few years now. Um, and, and I think that a lot of companies are looking at places like Topshop and Forever 21 that had this amazing presence on the high street but unfortunately did not see the future in the sense of innovation. Um, you know, the way they did business and all the money that they made, they felt like they can continue doing this for the next 10 years, not realizing actually, um, you know, you could have jumped onto that bandwagon and really invested in innovation and not be closed in 2021, but actually be more of a, a leader in this space, which I think was Topshop's downfall in that respect. Exactly. That's really still hard to believe that Topshop. <laughs> I know. I grew up on Topshop, so I was pretty exactly, shocked because yeah, yeah. they were well known in London for being innovators in the sense that like, they created the shopping experience. I don't know if any of you have been in Topshop in Oxford Street when it was around. Mm -hmm. You went in there when it was light. You came out when it was dark because you're just lost in this big space, you know. Um, so they were really well known for kind of creating this amazing space for their shoppers but unfortunately they did not do the same online or nor did they invest in innovation earlier on and they had the finance to do it which is a shame that they didn't let, let me just ask you something because Muchaneta mentioned before mm. that there are some people that maybe are just waiting to come back to what it was before and so are you more optimistic about that you sound like you are optimistic but you are optimistic or you think that this is the chance to convince them to do the leap but maybe we can lose this this chance i am optimistic that the majority will see the error of their ways <laughs> and invest because it's all about investing in innovation um we like other um, industries that have invested in technology if you look at the medical field um if you look at the sports industry they're all about innovation looking at new materials new ways that they can actually create their product the fashion industry unfortunately invests more in pr and marketing and not so much in innovation so i do feel like a lot of attention has been brought to the idea of investing in innovation uh which means that the companies are feeling that pressure you know to to bring something new to the table, to be part of this movement. And it is very much a do or die situation right now. You know, those that are kind of dragging their feet and hoping things get back to normal. Will we see them again in two years? We might not, they might not exist then. Um, so I do believe that companies will see that the error of their ways and they will educate themselves. Um, but I always say when I speak to brands that just because it's technology does not mean you have to invest in every type of technology. Just educate yourself on the innovations that are available and then invest in what works for your company. Because some fashion brands make that mistake of investing in AR or investing in, in, in uh, you know, VR. And then they do it for that one moment in time and then you never hear of it again. That is the mistake that most fashion brands have been making. They show that they're all about innovation, but only for a moment. We need them to join this marathon and not sprint through it, but actually join us in this marathon. Help us push that rock up that hill, you know, and get behind the whole idea of investing in innovation. Because not only will it help their business, it will also help this as kind of their goals when it comes to being more sustainable. You know, because, you know, that's more of a thing now, you know, as being sustainable is a requirement. It's no longer like a fashionable trend. Um, those who choose not to be, I don't think they'll be around in five years.
I mean, what do you think, Marta? Because I know you are all about sustainability. Yeah, well, I'm thinking, you know, it's really not every innovation for everyone. I, mm. I was uh, talking on the beginning of pandemic with small vintage boutique, luxury boutique, and they really wanted to, without much knowledge on the subject, to, to put uh, AR on their website. And, you know, think first, who is your customer? And first of all, this AR, uh, they, they put it through, it wasn't great. So the experience wasn't great. So people were just turning around. And also, you know, those ladies who are buying in this boutique, it was, it was just not for them. So the, unfortunately they had to, to close the, the business at least for a while, maybe I hope they will come back. But uh, this is what, exactly what you're saying. You know, le learn who your con consumer is and, and try to understand their needs, understand also the um, uh, the tech uh, uh, possibilities and the tech knowledge, what they are using, you know, mm -hmm. are you all about Gen Z and younger consumers and want to market to them? That's a very different approach than when you're talking to the grey market as well. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, but also remember if you're not innovating and you are um, targeting older markets, then once you're a consumer will die, you're going to die with them. So, <laughs> so just mm -hmm. have all this uh, in mind. The, the the other topic we can we have to address is the environmental issue, the environmental consequences, and so this is a very huge topic. This is a very, uh, I mean, everyone is talking about that, but it's a, it looks like it's very difficult to to find a solution or at least a, a direction direction. So, what's your perspective perspective on this? Should I start? I think there's a lot of innovation. Yeah, I can start. Um, I think there's a lot of innovation out there that will help brands be um, more sustainable. Um, it just depends what that word means to them and what they're looking to do. Um, are they looking to be more transparent with the supply chain? Are they looking to, um, you know, to kind of have certain materials in their collections that are more sustainable? I mean, what do you want? What does this word mean to you? And, and, and what is your goal? And I think only when they understand that will they then be able to take advantage of the technologies that are around right now. Mm -hmm. I start uh, slowly start using the word sustainability because it's such a vogue and huge word and, and it means something completely different from person, from brand to brand. So um, I'm thinking more, more about responsible fashion and consuming fashion more in a more responsible way. But regards uh, innovation, there's so much happening which have huge potential to to bring um, you know more sustainable <laughs> fashion. We can think about uh, digital sampling. We can think about um, all the uh, new fabrics innovation, which is uh, really exciting. Uh, uh, the even uh, you know the the um, it's predicted that uh, by 2030 over 10 percent of apparel will be connected to the internet so it can encourage transparency within the supply chain and it can allow to follow exactly how our garments uh, were made and learn more about the garment and maybe even highlight the role of craftsmanship so this is this is really nice but also when i'm thinking about the the innovation uh, there is also a lot happening in second-hand market and vintage market and you can see a lot of investments going in the field and also for example fitting technologies just recently the the, the startup z kit which you can be a model for for the clothes was um uh, was um bought by uh walmart so so that means something because that's a big player and you know Imagine now, you know, if we people are buying clothes online. Actually, I'm surprised because I heard from friends and even on social networks, I saw a couple examples of this that people are buying in bulk, you know, a couple of sizes, couple of styles, just try it at home and then send it back. That's the plan. And they are doing this uh, because it's super easy, but they don't really think about it. What's happened with the return clothes after, right? The many of those clothes are being just thrown away by the company because it's not worth to resell it again. They need to send it to the outlets or, or just destroy, uh, hopefully, the legislation, more legislation are coming. So all this innovation can help, you know, to take smarter decisions. So yeah, a lot is happening in the space. Exactly. And I also believe, just to add, um, a company first also has to realise that it's not possible to be 100% sustainable. It's just not possible right now. Um, but what is possible is to have a goal. Um, you know, if a company is like, I'm going to do 
in 2021. And then 2022, we're going to try and be 15% or 20%. And then slowly and gradually, you know, kind of become more sustainable. But without that goal of we're going completely green, because the chances are I will find something in your, in your green thing that makes it you're not green. So, you know, it's, once you kind of accept that as a fact that it's not possible right now to be 100% sustainable, um, then what you can understand that what is possible is that you can be somewhat sustainable. Um, and also I feel like policies is something that should also come into play when you talk about sustainability. Um, you know, it's not a space that is um, very much governed. So what Marta might say to me, I've got a brand and it's sustainable, and then I can say the same, but are complete, you know, it's completely different than what we consider to be sustainable. Um, so I think governments need to play a role in helping um, brands actually be sustainable and actually hold them accountable um, to what it is that their company does. And until that happens, um, we, you know, fashion brands as a whole can set their own standard of what it is to be sustainable, which is not the way forward, in my opinion. Yes, and just add, add on this, because I totally agree, you know, that uh, it's not possible to be 100% sustainable. But, you know, brands need to realize that consumers are not stupid and they are getting smarter and smarter. So greenwashing and just having a sustainable marketing advertisement or just one line it's it's not really good it's not just this is not the one step you need to try it a bit harder and be more transparent and just not use the the buzzword to bring more consumer in and to play as a mm. good one good player yeah stop spending money in sustainable marketing and spending on it. Going on. <laughs> <laughs> that's all i gotta say stop spending money on sustainable marketing and spend it on sustainable innovation then we're going then we're talking yeah. you know yeah I find that it's very interesting, the distinction between uh, to be sustainable and to be responsible. It's a, a thin, maybe, distinction, but it's very interesting. And do you think that the, the change is tech-driven or is, like, cultural-driven? As Marta said now, uh, the customer are not stupid, so the customer wants something and brands are going to do something for them. So it's like a cultural movement, if you can say that. So what do you think about the, 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 the relationship between mindset and technology, culture, culture and technology in this perspective? Okay, so, so you know, it's very difficult. I would love this to be consumer driven, but it's, it's going much slower. Of course, we're getting much, much, much more knowledgeable and, uh, and customers are getting smarter, but also the marketing tactics are getting better we are giving away so much data so brands can actually uh, manipulate us you know that that's also scary it's like how tech can play us and uh, and it's not very it's like you know i'm i'm working i'm working from quite recently in the game industry so uh, this is actually unbelievable how it's easy to manipulate us and you know with all the data tracking all this virtual world you know it's just having second life uh, it might be very interesting, but very dangerous where it might go. So I think you know, to design a tech business now, you really need to think about all the ethics and be aware where it might go. It's the same what's happening with the social networks now, how they manipulate people as well to, to buy some different things that not necessarily consumers <coughs> like. And still to make smarter decisions shopping, it's, uh, it's not very easy. It's not so straightforward and many people actually still don't know or they don't care because they have other problems as well. So fashion is not the most important for them. They're just bad things it's, to boost their moods. And, yeah. I think it's culture more than actually, because you know, if you look at all the different generations and how they approach um, buying a product, it's very different. How my mum approaches buying a product from John Lewis versus how I do it or versus how my little cousin do it, it doesn't, you know, we all want very different things. Um, so I think it, it, that's what basically plays a role. It, it's not technology per se, because technology is a tool. You know, people need to view technology as a screwdriver. You use it to screw something and then it's perfect and it's good to run. You know, it's not something that is, you know, that's physical or whatever. It is just a tool. It's a pencil. Um, and when people take that pencil, they can write what it is that they need to write in order to communicate. So, um, 
I think when it comes to tech, people shouldn't really view it as something that is this major big change thing. And oh my God, what's it going to do to the industry? It literally is your sewing machine. Think of your sewing machine. You know, it, it's a tool. And, and I feel like the industry is finding ways to use this tool in order to, to do good, some to do bad. Um, <laughs> when I say bad, I mean use information that consumers give, not for the benefit of the consumer, but more for the benefit of the bottom line. And that's what I mean, you know, I mean when I say bad. Um, and like Marta said, um, you know, a lot of us don't, didn't know before, I mean, we're a bit smarter now. They do collect a lot of data on us. Um, and we give it up and we give it up so we can use the technology. We give up our data so we can have an iPhone. Those who don't want to give up data have an old Nokia phone from 1994. So it, it, it's, it's a trade off, unfortunately. And if you want to stay ahead and you want the latest gadgets, you do have to trade off your data. But there are various um, startups that are finding ways to actually monetize that for consumers. So imagine if you give up your data to, let's say, let's say Zara, for example, and they know how you, they want to kind of learn your shopping habits. And then they say back to you, okay, if you give us X and Y, then we will give you 20% off your next purchase. So therefore you're not giving it away for free, which is what we've been doing for many, many years. So, I, I, you know, there are a few tech startups that are kind of coming, coming up with this type of innovation where it plays the middleman between the consumer and the shop to ensure that, you know, I, even though we have to trade our data, we get a little something back for it. So, um, so yeah, so I don't think that that's going to change with the data side of things, but I do feel like as a consumer, I would want something back for that information that you're getting off me. But in your opinion, this, uh, we can, we can call it an ethical side of fashion. It's not, I mean, mm. there's something ethical in this, in this, in this, uh, in this discussion and it, it is more or less profitable than the other side of fashion, because the naive question is why should I do that? I, mm. I can just do a bit of greenwashing. I can just do what it's cool now because something mm -hmm. is just cool. It's cool to be green. It's cool to be sustainable. It's cool to be responsible, but then just focus on profits. So why? I mean, it's a naive question, but on, pro on purpose. Mm. <laughs> uh, why should they be green? I think it's, it's required now. And, uh, and then consumer who who are getting more and more educated, they will understand that it is not real and they will feel, you know, that treated by the brand as well. So, so they will just turn away and, uh, and there's so many new business models rising on horizon. So, so there is so many opportunities and startups who are giving new opportunities and facilitates the sustainable decision for consumers that the brands need to rethink their decision if they just want to market sustainability. I mean, I still feel a little robbed by some brands that are embracing sustainability. Like if you go into a shop and then they charge you like double the price for a top that they can that is green versus, you know, just a normal t-shirt. To me, that I feel a little bit like I'm being cheated, you know, a little bit because, I, you know, why are you charging me double? And if you are going to have this green t-shirt, why not get rid of the other one and just sell the green t-shirt? You know, if I will know this is what I need to buy and that's what I'll pay for it. So I, I do feel like they need to either be completely in where everything is properly sustainable or have a plan of a like five year plan of like, OK, we're going to start creating products that are a bit more friendlier to the planet versus what we have already and slowly phase it out rather than have two options. Because the problem is with sustainability as a whole is that it only really appeals to a certain type of person. People who might want to be sustainable, who might not have the, the money, you know, um, they are unable to, to buy these products so easily. Um, I mean, they've got other options like the secondhand market and so forth. But if you want to buy something new and sustainable, you do have to have a certain amount of cash in your pocket because it, it is quite expensive and it can be quite expensive. So what I would like to see is the high street um, phasing out. Um, the normal clothes, let's call them, um, and then start bringing in much more, um, you know, earth-friendly, responsible collections um, that people who, who don't have a lot of money can actually maybe save up for and afford. So rather than buy that £65 sustainable t-shirt made out of God knows what, you're actually buying something that might be sixteen ninety nine from a high street brand that is a bit green. So I do, I do think that you, you know the word sustainability. You need to kind of appeal to everyone. And I don't think it does. 
I think they have a target market and they market it towards that type of person and that's the type of person that can afford to buy it. Yeah, I, I, yes, I, but I think, you know, the, the younger generation are much more open for new businesses and I think that I haven't been, but I would love to check. It's like there was still a collective in self reduce so you could also bring your old clothes and then buy some second hands. So in big uh, self reduce it's big um, uh, store uh, in, the, in Oxford Street, and I heard that there is a, a new um, company you can rent clothes, right? So you don't really need to, to, to have a big budget to, to get some sustainable fashion. You can just rent out something now or buy second hand. But of course, if you want something new, that's different. Uh, but, but, you know, people are much more open for those and just subscription model. So having like a library of clothes, especially for kids, it's getting more and more common. So, so that's, that's going to help being more sustainable for consumers. And if you're just you're screaming, you want to, you are sustainable, that, that won't work. So let, 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 let's, let, let's hope that it's going to be required. So everyone is going to follow this this path and we have we are running out of time L last thing i want to say is that uh, as you know in in, uh, in history after every pandemic uh, uh, there was uh, a moment of you know partying and people that wanted to spend spend money and just forget about the, the year before uh, so th this is not what we are aiming to this is not what we are hoping to or at least yes we are hoping to getting back our life but maybe just with some lessons learned and i think this panel gave us some beautiful perspective on this and some beautiful lessons we can try to to i, I can say spread around so if you have something to say just to summarize i mean what's importance what's what's important in this in this perspective in this future in the, in the, in the, in the next future maybe just on the positive note you know if we're gonna go out and party soon to celebrate the end of pandemic do not buy new clothes because we definitely have something in the back of our closet that we forgot and everyone else forgot but we can rewear it right <laughs> it will feel like new so uh so think about it think about your small decision everyday decision because in the bigger uh, scope it really make a difference so things about your own what what you can do and it can be small it can be really, really tiny and just try to make it as a habit i mean i think what i'd like to part this panel with is you know a word of the wise to the fashion businesses that are out there um and to take this moment to really think about how they can better the industry as a whole and how we can work together and, and knowledge share um, and also to just educate themselves you know and I've said this before if you go if you go to the medical field and you're a doctor you're constantly educating yourself you're constantly learning what the new um, innovations in the medical field are to keep up with what's going on to keep up with with I guess the time um, but in the fashion industry this is not the case you know you've got designers who graduated 20 years ago still practicing their old ways not really re-educating themselves uh, with the innovations that are out there so they can better the business um, so what I would say to them is go out there and educate yourself find out what works for your company um, you know look at the new business models that are out there right now that are really pushing forward um, you know businesses so they are ready for the future and you know last words think like a startup you know be open and be unafraid to take that leap because failure is not a, is not uh you know it's not a bad thing it's a learning moment so um i would say you know think like a startup and um embrace innovation thank you very much thank you very very much thank you marta thank you muchanetta and thank you very much see you, you see you me. see you see you soon take care and enjoy the rest of the event thank you thank you, thank you.